we have a distinguished panel. So gentlemen, you have under undertaken quite a serious task to set up a vision, a collective vision for the future. And I suggest uh, that we will start by you giving a short five to seven minutes overview. Then we'll have a round of reflections and then we will take questions from the audience. And I would ask the audience, please don't hesitate to put forward your questions here at Zoom or if you're watching us on the Facebook, then use Facebook and we'll discuss uh, the most relevant questions. So let's start in alphabetical order and David Takopian will be our first speaker. Please, David, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Mark, very much. And pleasure to be part of this distinguished panel and also important for me to be part of this very critical, national critical discussion about goals in general and the goal one, which is the vision setting. I will introduce me as an Artsakh government official. I'm proud to be part of the Artsakh government, but this is my last few months of history. Before that, I spent 26 years with the United Nations, 15 different countries, and as I was part of UNDP development program, I mean, Designing the vision, helping the government to design the vision, to implement the vision was one of the important tasks we as UNDP and myself as a manager of UNDP was involved in numerous places. And the countries, I can list few, but it starts from Moldova and Latvia when it was before Latvia joined European Union. And it goes to Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and then I moved to Afghanistan and then 10 years in crisis, Afghanistan, Somalia, and Syria is a bit of very different realities, but we setting the vision and let's say aiming to reach the goals of the vision was always an important part of my engagement in all those countries. And naturally, when you come to those countries and they try to work with the government, with the people defining the vision, you don't come empty handed, you try to do some homework. You try to understand what are the countries who succeed? What are the countries who are not successful? And that's it to, to give a couple of very, to me, interesting examples. I just want to give, for example, China as very interesting case, the way the China was transformed by the entire bin and his very pragmatic approach and his famous saying about the cat, it, it's not important what color the cat is, whether it's black or white, but whether it catch the mice, this is the most important. So this China's, despite the ideology, is a very pragmatic approach and it led to many, many results in China. Another interesting for me case is Singapore, for example. And it started with a vision to become the port in that region and from port, it moved to a trading hub. From trading hub, it moved to financial hub and then it became the technology hub. So it's again about vision, which is moving, evolving, and then you achieve one and then move to the other. But then at the same time, Singapore had free economy, but controlled society. So they felt that this is better way to move forward is to do it this way. Another interesting case, and I know that Israel being cited here and there, light and right and left on many different occasions. And, and I used also to study a lot about Israel, but for me, which is striking for me, Israel and Jews as the nation which had this 2000 years or more, the dream of the promised land with full of milk and honey promised land. And after they came to this promised land, instead of enjoying milk and honey, they soon after decided to build the startup nation. So this vision and about the promised land is somehow transformed into startup nation, which is also the way the evolution is happening also. I had also this, I uh, mean, so I can say probably a bit difficult uh, engagements in Afghanistan. They had 10 different visions for peace. And we all know where they are still now, unfortunately. And then there were like many, many visions how to achieve the peace, etc. And then things did not happen. Meaning one thing is to set the vision, the other thing to reach the vision. My engagement in Somalia, for example, although it's not much better than Afghanistan, for example, but my, our vision was much more pragmatic to build a federal Somalia and to organize a elect a proper democratic to, to the extent possible election. So we organized federal, we constructed the federal Somalia together with the government and people. And then we organized election. And then 
some difficulties started to follow, meaning the vision was practical, but then what came after the vision was not that easy. So, and I was also, I had interesting opportunity to be part of the team, a very complex team in New York, which was designing this global vision for 2030. 17 sustainable development goals, goals about everything from poverty to health, to education, to everything. And one important lesson, and this was like, I was chief of operation of the big team from intellectuals, politicians, civil society leaders, etc. I was the one running the machine in 2012, 2013. So all came clear, good goals, general assembly endorsing, etc. And then one important observation, for example, there's a goal about the health within the vision. And goal about health has 12 different targets and none of them was about pandemic. And then when the pandemic hits, all the goals became not much relevant. So meaning the life brings its own correctives and not necessarily the vision or the plan you set, you blindly follow it. And I'll come back to it a bit later also. So, I mean, it is about changing world, meaning we set the vision and then we follow it, but the world is changing itself. So for me, the way I want to define, and then the colleagues will come with their own definitions and we can have a bit more discussion on this also. So Armenia is a 21st century transport nation. And this is to me is very important, transport nation. And this is Armenia and diaspora. It's a unity of us together with a modern economy, effective governance and just society. And when I say just society, I mean two parts. It is a justice in Armenian. And it is just meaning artar, equal. So it is a combination of both, which I think is important to have in our mind because we are a small nation and we probably can and should care about those left behind more than the bigger nation. So we are like almost a family, a bit expanded family of Armenians around the globe. So it's much easier to construct and we all speak the same language. We share the culture of values. So naturally we have much more things in common than many other countries. Two more points I just want to reflect and then after I leave the floor to my colleagues also. There is something, some issue with our visions also and starting from the vision which Armenia 2020, which Nubara Feyan and Ruben Vartanian started. So for me, we need to analyze what was reason why it didn't work the way it was projected, the way it designed. I know there was a lot of intellectual effort put into this vision. Now we have vision 2041, and these goals came as more elaboration on this. Government came last just few weeks before the war with transformative strategy, which was the vision 2050. And there were many good goals, like to reach 5 million population in Armenia or to have like deep jump to 20 times to increase the economy of Armenia and many other things. But again, whether it happens or not, it is still a question to be seen. So for us, it's not just defining the vision, setting the goals, but defining also and trying to understand the process, how we are going to get there. And about the process, there is a one last example which I want to give. This is the Kennedy's moonshot. And this is, uh, and many people know about this, especially the US people. And this is part of the, I mean, soon after the Soviet Union launched, the, I mean, Yuri Gagarin went to open space in April, 1961. Kennedy had in May, his speech to the Congress where he put his dream about by the end of decade to reach the moon, American to land on moon and come back. So it was totally not clear, the scientific solutions that he had put the budget, which later was exceeded, I think 10 times. And he put many other things which were corrected, adjusted. But the point was he clearly defined the destination the way he want to be, the nation want to reach the moon and come back. And then the process, the direction, how they go there, you have to adjust and you have to move carefully because things are changing around you. So, and connect related to this, this is very rapidly changing world where many parameters are changing around us. It's not to set the vision and for the next 20 years, just to blindly follow the vision, but be open-minded, understand what happens in our neighborhood, in the world, with the new technology and be able to, to, to move towards the goal with all the adjustments we need to make while we are moving. So I will stop here and then we will follow up later with some more feedback. Thank you.
Thank you, David. And uh, Georgi Derlogan is our next speaker. Good evening. Um, let me start with several points, which I think are very important to make. Uh, it is very um, tempting to speak about, about high technology and that the world is faster and more inter interconnected. This reminds me of my students who are all very good at speaking about empowering women, building capacity, connecting the world and social entrepreneurship, but only two mm -hmm. out of 16 in my class last Monday knew why petrol or benzene needs to be poured into the tank, gas tank of a car. So the connection between automobile and oil is not quite obvious to majority of them. And those two, by the way, were both from South Korea. So it is very important you know, to think in basic terms. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not an artist, no poet. I'm more like a social engineer. I want to see how would one thing connects. I want the humans to fly. I want them to be happy. That's poetry. My business is to figure out how to put a human body, which is heavier than air, airborne, and how to bring it back, preferably safely to the ground. So I think you know, one of the major issues that we often neglect is providing employment, and that might be low skill employment to majority of Armenians in Armenia. You know, and this is very important, it create, creates public goods, by the way. Now, this is how you build roads and just renovate infrastructure. You know, Yerevan quite often has a shameful appearance. Just walk down the Hrazdan River if you're in Yerevan. You know, not even listening to all those gaudy and awful, uh, very bad taste restaurants. You know, but just see how much filth there is in the Razdan Gorge. And this is actually a potentially a gem of the city. You know, this uh, should be in many cities, you know, very centered, they're proud of their rivers. And you know, here the river is a sewer in every sense. So start there. Okay, it needs some organization. So we need a government, you know, we always are prepared to give advice. My question is to whom? Who is listening? And who is going to implement your advice? We are great at advice. Of course, those of you who know Russian, they know probably the old joke about we are the country of Soviets, my strana Sovietov. But the ship, it will not give you a ship to slaughter, but we can give you advice you know, how to gain one. So we need to think politically about this. Why anybody would listen to, the, uh, to us in the government, whatever is the government? Uh, the third point is any of the full vision become possible at all. And there I'm actually more optimistic, you know, with, for instance, with China, to me, it is quite clear that in the late 1960s, the United States were actively looking for an ally in geopolitics to balance against Russia. It would be a nightmare, Russia joining capitalist Europe nightmare for Washington. Where is the place for America if Russia goes capitalist and unites with Europe? So this is why everything was done to prevent capitalist transition in Russia so that it doesn't, it becomes a gangster country but not part of the European Union. And everything was done to help China. And it must be granted, Deng Xiaoping and his successors were very good at grabbing the opportunity. Same story with Singapore. Of course, you know, this is the country where sometimes I joke, you know, an Armenian would understand Chinese without translation. You know, this is a refuge for the Chinese who were slaughtered in the neighboring countries, very much like Armenians. You know, they were slaughtered because they were thought to be too socialist and at the same time too capitalist, exploiting the locals. You know, the standard accusations, you know, that you are shopkeepers and at the same time you're troublemakers with your communist parties. Uh, Singapore benefited massively from the United States war in Vietnam because the United States needed a refueling base. And then you could take on from that. 
Are there any such, con and of course I don't mention even Israel. Are there any such conditions in Armenia today? I think there might be, actually, you know, because let's look at the map. There are two countries in the world who are massively not interested in Armenia's development. And you know those names. It's one nation, they claim. You know, there are others who are more agnostic about it, but there is nobody who is seriously hostile. So if you look at places like France or Germany, you know, they're not hostile, you know, even the United States, you know, to Armenia becoming more prosperous, which is already good. Strangely enough, the Islamic Republic of Iran might not be hostile, you know, to the development of Armenia. But the main beneficiary is, of course, Russia. Because look at South Korea, for instance, in the 1970s, you know, the United States, or look at Taiwan, the United States, of course, were their military protectors. Without American military, there would be no South Korea or no Taiwan. However, it is a burden to patrol in a poor country. So it was American interest you know, to uh, make sure that South Koreans succeed in their markets, uh, even in the automobile market. You know, bring your Hyundai, if you wish. You know, and others could not, but South Koreans could. Why? Because there were American soldiers in South Korea. We have Russian soldiers and we have a massive diaspora in Russia. Now this is a diaspora. So this is actually ground for optimism we can discuss. And finally, people always ask, you know, so what, what kind of solutions might you propose? And I would propose actually building schools, several schools, big schools, not only like in Dilija. Why big? and why probably boarding schools and why uh, orphans of the soldiers falling in the recent war might have the priority because we need national elites. This is not an education reform proposal. I'm speaking about the kind of toy soldiers regiments with which Peter the Great, the future Tsar of Russia used to play when he was a child. And those two regiments, you know, when they were 12 years old, you know, real boys from local villages, were, of course, were toys. When they were, uh, when they were 18 years old, you know, they became the palace guards and they ensured the prevalence of succession in favor of Peter the Great. So I'm speaking not only about schools in Armenia or schools in Armenia, which must be funded very well, which we can fund. I'm not speaking about higher education. The schools that can bring students to the level of hard entrance of, to Harvard, MIT, or FISTER in Russia. We are, we are not realistically speaking about building an Armenian Harvard. That's not realistic because I work at one of such universities. I can tell you, you know, it costs about three to five billion dollars a year. Where are you going to raise that? You know, and that is not yet assured. But high schools, boarding schools, you know, that could be quite more assured. And moreover, that would be the reason why those who gain education abroad might come back. This would be also very important for diaspora if their children spend a year or at least even a summer in Armenia at a decent school that might mightily help diaspora to preserve itself. I think, you know, that's more than enough on the plate now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have Eric Hakopian, who is who, who, who has been waiting to start speaking, and he was waiting from California. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me and to be with such a distinguished panel with friends, to be honest. Uh, everyone on this panel is a friend. Uh, I would say uh, I come from a more distinctly political background rather than academic one. Um, or an international diplomacy one, as uh, David has. Uh, I sort of approach everything as a campaign. Uh, I think when you're talking about a vision, you're talking about two specific things. Visions have two parts. It's the pro. It's what I call prose and uh, poetry. Uh, you need the grand, you know, the the beautiful words of where you want to go, and then very very hard practicalities, very specific practicalities of where you want to go. Uh, vision in the context of the 21st century is frankly public relations. It has very little to do with the actual vision of where you want to go because so much of it is the story you tell about itself. Every successful institution in the world, whether it's a country, a corporation, uh, an individual even, or a university, 
it tells a story about itself. Uh, what is our story? Uh, so far, right now, we don't have a story. Uh, our story internationally is uh, genocide, uh, war, uh, all the negativities, all the things that are perceived as negatives and should be perceived as negatives around the world. Uh, something as simple as the genocide issue, uh, instead of focusing, which, you know, for the most part, we have learned in 106 years that the world really doesn't care. And we learned that in very specific ways last year. Uh, and what's important for us to tell the story there is not really the genocide itself, but it's the resurrection that matters. Many people have gone through these exercises and never, never survived. We did, and not only survived. We went on to successes in many ways over the last hundred years, whether it was in the Soviet context or the post-Soviet context. So we need to tell a story about ourselves. Uh, and that story is, you know, that we're around, that we're creative, that we're doing great things. Uh, and and uh, let's not forget, we are practically in our region, an island of freedom in a sea of tyranny. Uh, in very, very difficult circumstances, we have shown the world that geography is not an excuse for tyranny. Because, and the reason why this is important is because part of your story, part of your narrative and vision setting is really not just what you are and what you're not. You know, there's negative identity. And when it comes to the context of negative identity, uh, our, our neighbors, which are in many ways decrepit states, especially to the east and west of us, provide us a tremendous opportunity to tell a great story about what we are compared to what they're not. So I think that's, that's part of it. In the grand vision of things, the sto our story is of not survival, but resurrection and, and being an island of freedom and not succumbing to the temptations of totalitarianism. You know, for the, we, the, the, you know, this Israeli example was used, and I think I don't think necessarily it's a good example for, for us in, in real terms. But you know, for seventy years they've talked about you know being the only democracy in the Middle East. Now you can argue that's really not the case, but that's the common standard belief, uh, and that's something that we can harp on. But let's talk about you know what does this all lead to? In practicalities, it essentially leads to three things. It's to you know, it's the three competencies. What we learned in last year's war is that we either don't have a state in many places, or we certainly don't have any competence in that state. So everything that we do needs to focus on the three things, competent economy, uh, which can actually allow you to do the other things. A competent economy allows you to build a competent state, and a competent state allows you to build a competent military. Everything, just those three points, frankly, it's the alpha and the omega. Everything that leads to that is a good thing. Everything that leads away from it is a waste of time. Uh, what I would say is all of these visions and everything, it, it's good. I was frankly reluctant to take part in something like this. And if it wasn't for the caliber of the people involved, I wouldn't because I get, a, I get an email like this every day. About some 200 people are going to get together and tell everyone what to do, which is ridiculous in most cases. Uh, I would say we should all err and we should err on the side of action. Anything that leads to action on these three points that I outlined is a good thing. Anything that leads to more talking, uh, more panels or more recommendations is a bad thing, you know? So we should just move on in the practicalities of, of what we're looking at. So I wanted to keep it short and keep it very succinct. And that's all I have to say as far as where we wanna go with the vision issue. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you, you were really short, but uh, very valuable, I, I have to say. Now we have uh, another round of reflections, and we already have a couple of questions, which I am keeping close to my chest uh, until this uh, round of reflections is over. So David Akopian, please. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, and really nice to hear, I mean, Eric and Georgi, different perspectives on this complex discussion points we are having. I just, uh, two reflections on two points you both, different points you mentioned, the story and the vision, totally with you, Eric, and I think this story of Armenians, which we somehow managed to survive for 3,000 years through many changes in the world, and there is certain reason for this, and this story is need to be probably better 
told, which were not that good, are were connectors, we were traders, we were, I mean, inventors uh, and, and many other things. So, but we were adapting easily. We're learning, adapting, changing ourselves, but we were not that much changing the world because we were used to live to the bigger powers and we had to be adaptive to survive in the complex realities. So, and second reflection is what Georgi, you said about edu schools. I probably will put it a bit broader to me, this education per se, because I was traveling and I'm in Arsakna, Stefan Akert, recently to the villages on the borders and amazing things for me. I mean, you go to some universities, you feel this is the 19th or 20th century archaic way of thinking or teaching. And then suddenly you go to schools and you see these bright kids with the sparkle and shining eyes looking for something different and already connected with internet and learning fast on so many different things, meaning it's not the physical house or, or for the school, but it is the open space of knowledge, which has many more means to get to the kids in those remote villages and opportunity to lift them up to the requirements of the new world. I think there are many more than just the actual schools and the teachers, which come also from different era could give them. Thank you. Uh, Georgi Derlukian, please. Uh, your microphone is off, uh, Georgi. Please turn it on. Okay, that's fine. I, I try you know, not, to, not to interfere with you. What could I tell you about schools? Uh, too many things, you know, but we have to create, who are we? Reasons for Armenians to come to Armenia. At some period of their life, or to stay, you know, when they're young and entrepreneurial, when they're children, because their parents are looking for a good country to raise their kids, or when they are retiring. And since the lifespan is expanding, I think, you know, this is my case, of course, you know, that people can look to live another 30 years in retirement. Armenia could be a great place, you know, for this. Uh, so I'm speaking about schools as one of possible attractions. I'm speaking about clean environment, good wineries, museums. Again, you know, think they are, these are reasons you know, for Armenia to become a destination. Face it, you know, that right now, you know, why the food is so fabulously good in Armenia? Because McDonald's never cared to arrive. You know, there is no IKEA store in Armenia because this is the backwater. You know, they never even came, you know, because so much of food production here is actually not post-industrial, but pre-industrial, which is why it is great. We'd have to make it post-industrial because it's no longer sustainable. But I am always very suspicious of the um, pronoun we. Who are we? We need to form specific committees, you know, either waiting for the government or the people with wealth in diaspora, and those are mostly in diaspora, in different diaspora, and put the money into this kind of committees. You know, so much money, you know, that the government would not be able, regardless of whoever is the Varchapet currently, would not be able to ignore you and start doing your projects. And by the way, there is glory in that. There is glory because this is one of the most glorious nations, and I can tell you as a sociologist, it is, and it's difficult to compete on glory with Armenians, as we know, but there is mostly glory in turning around the world and you know, in showing, you know, that you could do something. And this is a sizable country which has fairly good conditions to be turned around. You know, so just try and we know what to do. Thank you. Eric, please. Uh, actually, I was reflecting on Georgi's recommendation about education, which I think, uh, even though I think his is a very practical recommendation, uh, but I think what he's really in a broader sense talking about is a center of excellence. And we've discussed this before. Uh, what this country needs is countless, countless centers of excellence. And his, what Georgi was mentioning to be a center of centers of excellence in education. Uh, and I mean, let's just give you a living example of it. I'm, I'm, I just, I got here to California a couple of days ago and it was announced that uh, essentially the state of California is funding $9 million to TUMO to open up a branch in Southern California. 
And all of this is a brainchild of one visionary person working with multiple, many other visionary people about 10, 15 years ago to set up something that is being copied around the world. In fact, I think Angela Merkel opened up the Tumor of Berlin a couple of uh, weeks ago. <clears throat> so that is a center of excellence. And if you can get to, in a country, small country like Armenia, you get to 15 or 20 centers of excellence, you can transform the country. Uh, right now, our centers of excellence are something like Tumo or multiple, you know, these, some of those tech startups that we have, which are, you know, are, are going to be worth in the, you know, we're, we're probably going to have three or four unicorns by next year, this time, which are startups that are worth more than a billion dollars. So, uh, I think that's what you're looking at as far as what, uh, what, what do you need to build on? It is everybody picks up their corner. Uh, it, it, it is a disgrace, for example, that we don't have, you know, one world-class hospital in this country, uh, given that, you know, there's excellence in medicine all over the world from Paris to, uh, to Moscow, to Los Angeles, to New York, some of the best doctors in the world are meeting, but we have not collectively built one great hospital. Some of the great academics in the world are Armenian, but I think we only have one school in the top 1,000 in the world of in the universities. So uh, center of excellence is, is a place that you want to focus on. It is something that each person in their own corner of uh, whatever you're an expert on, you can get together and work on. It doesn't need to be something that's universal. The second thing that I think Georgi touched on, which I, this is, you know, this has been discussed before, you know, we need to build a state State building is expensive. You don't build a state in millions. You build a state in billions. And that's, that's reality. Uh, collectively, you know, the top 20, 30 Armenians in the world, the wealthiest, probably have assets in the 50, 60 billion dollar range. And I'm probably being conservative. Uh, of all of those people, you know, outside of two or three names, which we all know, None of them are really any, doing anything substantial here. When, for, when I'm not even talking about charity, I don't care about charity. Uh, you have some specialty, wherever you've made a fortune in, you know, have one branch of what you're doing it here. Uh, and we have not been focused on state building. Uh, our diaspora institutions have not been focused on state building. Over 30 years, we have failed, failed to build a competent state. Part of that, frankly, is funding. Part of it, historically, obviously, especially before the revolution, was the issue of trust. Who do you trust to give money to, to actually build the state, when the state itself was somewhat of a criminal enterprise? But, you know, we've made progress on that front. So I would say it's two things as far as reflections. One, focus on building centers of excellence. And two, understand that this is going to take resources. And it's going to take the, re it's going to take the resources of people that have a great deal of resources, but are few in number. They need to be committed to using those resources to build a competent state. Uh, let me add to what you said, Eric, that we also need uh, a, very, uh, a very smart uh, regional approach because the 30 years or so of our independence have shown that uh, we cannot stay alone. We have to build some sort of relations with uh, the countries in the region. And uh, I mean, I believe it's a must whether we can, we might, or we not. And here we are bumping to uh, the uh, negativity in our uh, national identity, which is a very serious issue. I don't want to diminish it by any ways. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's my little reflection. <laughs> Now, uh, we have several questions. Uh, Ruben Injikian writes that Israel was based on the idea of Zionism developed in 19th, 20th centuries, meaning the return to the lands of ancestors. They knew that it was an uh, arid land with difficult climate, but it was their land where they were planning to build up their state. Maybe Araratism or Armenism is needed, or a strengthened version of reconciliation and repatriation, once quite successfully tried by the Soviet Armenia. Let us start in reverse alphabetical order now. So, Eric Hakopian, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Well, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. I just don't know how, again, I think that there's too much, uh, people make too many of these Israel Armenia comparisons because of Holocaust genocide. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it's, uh, the Israeli side started off with tremendous advantages in many ways uh, over where we're at. You know, essentially, you know, it started during a period of colonialism in which you have a European people moving into a colonial uh, situation in which they had the upper hand. And frankly, in every war that they've been in, except for a short period in 1973, they've had the technological and military advantage over its enemies, who for the most part were never as, uh, never as competent as some of our enemies, but specifically the enemies to the east of us. So, I mean, to the West of us. So uh, I, I think this, this, I'm not sure how relevant this uh, comparison is. I think it's, it's, it's easy to make. Uh, and secondly, frankly, our diaspora uh, institutions, you cannot even compare them in, in, in their scope and vision and resources and understanding and sophistication to the Jewish diaspora worldwide. I'm sorry, we're just not there yet. So I think any comparisons are, are really dead ends. Thank you. Georgi, please. Well, Armenia had its advantages. And the major advantage in the 20th century was that it was part of the Soviet Union. It's not that the Soviet Union or Stalin particularly liked Armenians, but it was prepared to fight a world war and they needed to mobilize all the resources by whatever means they could you know so there was a huge leap to development you know this is why largely armenia today is not part of the middle east but rather it is southern europe somewhere and we have rather south european politics uh we have the levels of education and so it's a good level you know to start uh from uh, if we were speaking, you know, a year ago, we would be much more optimistic. You know, we would also boast, you know, that we have an excellent army. No longer, you know, so there is a, this very brutal awakening, you know, going on. That's another um, uh, reason to uh, to support Eric's argument that this is not quite like Israel. You know, so all uh, kind of uh, there are no parallels in history very much like between the mountains and Ararat uh, is unique. Fujiyama is different, uh, but we know that they are mountains. You know, so you can look into other countries and this is my job. And I would be very glad to teach, you know, I, I wrote books about, you know, how to look into the experience of other countries in the Russian and in the Eastern Armenian. You know, so you can look into the experience of Singapore, of uh, China, and try to understand how other games were played. The only way to become a commentator in sports is to watch many, many other games. You know, each game is unique, but there is a general um, algorithm. You know, so this algorithm uh, suggests, you know, what is to be avoided. Unfortunately, you know, nobody listens, you know, to what is to be avoided in Armenian politics. You know, people are very focused on local politics. It also says, you know, so what uh, what might be done, you know, what it is usually useful to do, you know, like these centers of excellence that Eric mentions. Uh, so again, we were coming, you know, back to the main issue, you know, we actually, I think we know what needs to be done, but it takes a lot of concerted political will and money those two things you know so we do need poetry for good sloganeering just immediately after that we need to get together and figure out how would this fly that's all okay thank you david please yes maybe i mean israel i mentioned in a, from different perspective but for me it was the startup nation idea and again you cannot have everybody start up you have one who starts and the other follow so what could be the next startup and how we can find the niche for us? And this is, again, a question, open question for us, for Armenians. But one important thing, and Georgi, totally agree with you, if we can bring more diaspora Armenians like you both are to Armenia, 
And this is the point about, and me coming back after 20 years also to Armenia. And this is the point which I was recently reading the Netflix CEO book about concentration of talent. You cannot create new knowledge if you don't have enough concentration of talent. So knowledgeable people need to come together and only together, and there you get exponential growth. Many people with smart ideas, sharing, finding solutions, etc. and together. It could be about centers of excellence, centers of growth. It could be microscopic, but it could gradually grow into something bigger. Also, the state building. And Eric, I have been in so many places in state building and I've seen so many failures in state building because usually people associate state building in writing constitution and organizing election ballot books and ballot paper stuff. While for Afghans it's totally incomprehensible what type of election, why they need to put finger in the ink and then to do some magic. So for me, the state building, actual state building, building competent institutions could in Armenian case having our advantage with so many diaspora knowledgeable people is again, trying to bring them all back to place into the right places to have enough concentration of this talent with various institutions. And then after we can make the quantum leap. Thank you. Now we have an, uh, another question, which is why don't we ask the Armenian church to spend its richness to build a competent state? Uh, <laughs> Uh, gentlemen, who wants to answer this question? Uh, well, I mean, listen, it's almost impossible to answer that question without getting into trouble. But, uh, yeah, I mean, in many ways, I don't say this as a slight on believers, uh, because I think people have genuine faith, but institutionally, the Armenian church, uh, doesn't do really anything for nation building or the country itself. It's it's more of a uh, it's a you know it's a real estate empire with a baptism, funeral, wedding service on the side. So as a functional, I mean, you can look at the for example the Black Church in the United States. You can look at in South America things like liberation theology of how the church is involved. You know, our church is a complete failure when it comes to serving the Armenian people. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, any other responses? No, I see uh, David and Yuri are silent. So let's go to the next question. Uh, Gagik Tovmasyan uh, asks, it doesn't require huge sums to set up an educational fund, which will send abroad students to spe in specialities urgently needed to improve incompetence of Armenian judicial and governance systems. The now defunct Lewis Foundation was something like that, but without focus on specialities. Maybe we need to adopt some of the Georgian experiences in created, um, creating West educated elites. Mm. I'll just add to this question that there is a very interesting experience from Kazakhstan, and there is a very interesting another experience from Azerbaijan. But please, gentlemen, uh, David and uh, Georgi, you didn't uh, uh, speak about the previous question, so uh, you have the chance to be the first here. Uh, I think, I mean, building institutions per se is not that easy. And for me, it was part of my UNDP work and life to try to build institutions. And the critical thing, it needs to come with from the purpose. And that's why this vision discussion, then you we define the vision and then we try to define a vision for different sectors, like vision for education, we discuss vision for health, vision for many environment and many other things. And then after with different institutions, including government institutions, they are getting the purpose. So there should be a national consensus goal eight, I don't know, whichever goal we have is about education to build educated, informed, knowledgeable, whatever creative population, next generation. And then how we get there. And then the ministry need to come with a plan, structure, and again, goal is clear, the road 
to that destination is a question. And then public and society and government need to have a constant interaction and try to see, are we progressing against these goals? How far we are progressing, what we are getting? Unfortunately, this did not happen the way it was supposed to happen in the last many years. And this, I mean, state building in Armenia institutionally was not that successful. And then we all are here and many more need to come back and we need to roll our lead and try to do our best to make institutions functional. But this is not that simple. Right? There's no one magic formula, I mean, to define and then after institution becomes success, functional or effective. Uh, so as far as I understood, David, you're, uh, you're saying that it's the vision that's coming first, then we have goals and then we have roadmaps of how to put these mm -hmm. goals. No, and for sure. I mean, very practically, like I was discussing with the team for 2050, for example, Prime Minister's team also, Transformative Strategy 2050. There was a goal to have a population of Armenia in 30 years from now, 5 million instead of current 3 million. And how to get there? It was not obvious whether we increase migration, increase the reproduction or approaches. So to many, if we put a goal and then after we try to identify how we get to this goal and each goal is very specific and the institution behind need also to come with its own plan and then have a system how to, to re measure the progress and then report on the progress. Uh, there are also political parties, each of which have its own way of resolving problem. But I'm interfering too much, Georgi, please, if you want to participate in, in answering this question. Thank you. I do often wonder whether political parties have their way of resolving some things. This is called political program. You know, because my impression is that majority of them have much simpler agendas you know get get me elected uh, we will throw out the bumps uh, it was a very good question raised you know so why not send enough students you know to other countries for education uh, georgia did it uh, let me ask immediately you now but where is georgia you know, seriously, you know, how much did it help Georgia? You know, there is a huge uh, experience of sending students abroad or training them in foreign languages. This is the way of leaving the country. So the question must be uh, how not only to send them, but how to bring them back. Why would they ever come back, you know, to, uh, to their countries of origin? And this is a problem which has two sides. So the solution has two sides. One is material. There must be reasons to come back, but there must be also the reasons, you know, to um, kind of, of patriotic nature. And that's why I'm speaking about boarding schools. I'm speaking about kind of Juncker corpus. You know, so this was tried, you know, Grand Decole in France. You know, so it must be very prestigious to be in Armenia. That's all. Mark, it's now okay. you. Sorry, I was <laughs> for a second. We have another question to David Hakopian. Mm -hmm. uh, a lady, Shovik Shoshana Shahbazian, is uh, asking, is saying, she claims that she was not permitted to enter into Artsakh, uh, even though she is a citizen of Armenia. And the question is what the Artsakh government does to help us. I mean, from what I know, all the citizens of Armenia never face any. Ah, she says she's not a citizen of Armenia, so it's. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, this is um, beyond, I mean, our scope of discussion and beyond the control of the government of Arsakh. Unfortunate reality is the Russian peacekeepers are the ones in control, and they are. Certain rules only citizens of Armenia and citizens of Russian Federation are allowed without any problem. With all the rest, there is a checking. And most usually, if this is person of Armenian origin, they are allowed unless there is a specific problem. But it's again, every time case specific decision. Okay, now we have another question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, 
why none of these recommendations were implemented in the past 30 years. May I try? <laughs> sure. Uh, I teach a course on economic development where we read books by World Bank economists. Uh, they are wonderful and you know, very intelligent people, but they are also very naive. You know, so they describe country after country where good policy measures that they have been recommending for 50 years have failed. So the question is, uh, why is that? And you know, could it be that what you can see the failure is someone's interest? Actually, the majority of politicians, by definition, are in politics for their own interest. It very much depends on society and on ideologies of society, you know, why they would behave in a broader interest. Uh, this was usually in European history, this was usually achieved through revolution and war, you know, when the country was threatened with extinction. So in this case, actually, you know, Armenia is in a fairly good position. Again, you know, I have written quite a lot about this, you know, how states are actually built. You know, so my job is to go into archives, to go into books and see what actually happened in Napoleonic France. You know, not what we usually um, kind of poetically presume or watch in the movies or hear in pronunciations of the politicians. You know, so when we need to study the questions, you know, not of corruption, but of the countries which are exceptional because corruption is relatively low. Why is that? You know, so in, uh, in a sense, you know, corruption, unfortunately, is just as predictable as friction in any mechanism, because state apparatus is a mechanism. Friction is perfectly predictable, but it doesn't mean that we should immediately, you say, uh, that we can live with that. To the contrary, you know, in engineering, so much ingenuity goes into creating all kinds of lubricants and at the same time, you know, cooling systems, you know, so that engines don't fail because of corruption of the rust. Uh, what needs to be done, there are actually very uh, good specific studies, such as Vadim Volkov, who is the rector of European University of St. Petersburg, did very good research on post-Soviet police and judiciary. What needs to be done, how many people actually even heard about it. You know, but there is a good website, European University of St. Petersburg, uh, the Laboratory of Law Enforcement, you know, uh, Pravo Primenenia, Laboratorio Pravo Primenenia. Uh, there are more specific uh, uh, recommendations, but it's a very good question. Why politicians don't do that? They don't do that because they, they think they can get away. That's why. That's all actually very, very simple. You know, and there are three things that politicians fear. Uh, one of them is intrigue or palace intrigue that has been true for the last 5,000 years, as long as palaces had existed. So somebody from the elite might displace you because you are next to gold chest. But there are two other, and this doesn't bring uh, any transformation. You know, this is what we normally observe and we actually observed in the last 25 years in Armenia. There are two other possibilities, actually. You, know, you might be overthrown in a revolution so you might actually need competent state and police. This is what you see happening in uh, Russia under Vladimir Putin, and at least strengthening his uh, repression apparatus. Uh, his, uh, not only police you know, and the military, but his finance to pay for that. You know, Russia has quite notice you know, the, where Russian ex areas of excellence are. Very good finance system. And then there is the foreign war. Russia only recently woke up to the realization that uh, while they worried uh, of the NATO expanding into Ukraine, Azerbaijan actually, they're now boasting, you know, that they became uh, NATO, a NATO member by the back door. I don't know how much the United States or other Western allies are happy about acquiring uh, this ally. This is a separate, um, it's not an ironic question. How happy are they? You know, but there are two ways of making the elites scared. Revolution and losing foreign war. 
We have both of them present in Armenia, which is why I am reasonably hopeful. You know, our elites are scared. You know, they understand, you know, they must act. And they might be listening for those reasons. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Unfortunately, our time is over, but we can use the advantages of the internet to say just a couple of words at the end of our conversation. So, uh, Eric, please. Well, uh, I think, again, we'll just reiterate what we discussed before. I don't think, uh, you know, simplicity on things like this is our friend, complexity is our enemy. Uh, let's focus on the three competencies, economy, state, military. Everything that leads to doing, creating that is a good thing. Everything that doesn't is a waste of time. So uh, I think this is, uh, and again, you know, we've talked about a lot of, uh, most of our talk has been about bad things and negatives. And in some strange ways, I'm actually uh, parlaying what Georgi said, you know, we, we do have advantages. We do have things going for us. And one of the things that we haven't discussed outside of those three competencies is culture. Uh, you know, we have a very coherent, competent culture, which in fact has actually kept this country together when all other institutions were failing. Uh, in fact, you can actually make the case that the strength of our culture, you know, has, has given the state sector an opportunity to be incompetent. So I think we need to use the cultural competencies to build the state. Some of the more practical things, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, getting the, you know, a competent state. Part of it, frankly, is, is pay and money. There's plenty of competent people in Armenia, except none of them are in the state sector. Now, why would they be? Why would I want to make, you know, $300 as a bureaucrat when I can make $1,500 as a programmer? Uh, so it's a question of turning the private sector functionality into public sector functionality. And I'll give you a perfect example uh, of where you can, you know, that we already have a living example. The, the Armenian Central Bank, by law, has to pay uh, salaries that are equivalent of the public sector, of the private sector. Uh, and we have actually a very competent central bank, and you can see it on, on our uh, currency situation compared to other countries. You know, we've gone through COVID, we've gone through war, we've gone through a political crisis. And uh, when I was looking at the numbers this morning, I think the, the, the drama is devalued by two or three percent at this point compared to where it was right before the war started. Uh, and that starts with having a central bank that was, uh, you know, paid competently and run by competent people. I think as a starter, what we can do is to go into, for example, two sectors, the foreign ministry and the defense ministry, and to start professionalizing those. You start from there as you build onto the other sectors, because those two are the most critical. For example, I think our foreign ministry has a $30 million budget. You cannot run a competent foreign policy with a $30 million budget. It doesn't work. You're going to end up with systems that are not working or people that aren't being paid competently or the best and the brightest not going into that. But uh, that's that. I'll leave the floor to other people. Thank you very much. Uh, David Hakopian. Yes, two points just concluding also the discussion, I guess, from myself also. I think one is, yes, um, Armenia, unfortunately, is a group of majority of the countries, which are somewhere in between. There is a group of early starters, I mean, startups moving fast, I mean, finding a niche and take, creating an economic prosperity. And it happens every decade, you get few new movers and things are moving also from west to east and wherever, from north to south, etc. So it's not limited to this or that geography. And to me, second point, and what I discovered myself, which is the most promising part in Armenia, this amazing young generation in Armenia, which I am enjoying every single conversation I'm having with hundreds of people on so many different subjects. And again, traveling across the world, working in 15 or 20 different countries, and never, I never have so much enjoyment in interacting with people, the, the amount of interaction, interesting ideas, creative approaches to the solutions is, I mean, some are speaking, Georgi, about passionality in Armenia. It is something special. Unfortunately, we face the challenge, but at the same time, this bubbling creativity, which comes from the youth, or up to, I guess, 35, 40, although the age is not the limit, but the state of mind 
is the quality. And I think this is the most important promising part of Armenian society. And we need to combine the experience which could, could, could be taken from outside and with energy creativity from inside and together we can build a better Armenia for the future. Thank you very much. So, uh, gentlemen, we were speaking about the goal one, and it was about setting a vision for future, a, a collective vision for future. Uh, if I'm summarizing our conversation, and I would ask, um, I would apologize um, uh, to those people whose questions were not asked during this conversation, uh, some of the questions you can go uh, on the website of Future Armenian, find them there and answer if uh, you would like to do that. Uh, we talked that in, uh, we have to turn to basics mostly. It's employment, uh, we need organization, we need a competent government. Uh, and and uh, Eric Hakopian was very specific in saying that the competency comes economy, government, military in this uh, sequence. And uh, very interesting, another very interesting thing was said that we need a story. We need a story which would not be negative. It is something to think about, uh, I believe, actually. And we need to make Armenia attractive mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in very many spheres and in very many ways. Uh, centers of excellence was also a very interesting idea. So uh, I believe this uh, discussion was a very fruitful one. Thank you very much. The uh, panelists today were David Hakopian, um, uh, uh, a chief advisor to the state minister of uh, Republic of Artsakh, uh, Georgi Derlugian, professor of New York University in Abu Dhabi, and Eric Hakopian, political consultant and host at CivilNet. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.